And before we get started, uh, we do need to pray again for Mark Brandel. Uh, he is, as we speak, back in the hospital uh, tonight. So I want to read you the text messages, and I think you'll kind of get an idea here uh, of what is happening. Um, so he sent me this. This is earlier today. Uh, hi, Pastor. I'm back in Straub with an elevated and irregular heartbeat. They're thinking about doing an ablation where they freeze or cauterize uh, key uh, points on the heart to get the rate and rhythm normal. They can do that uh, through an artery, through either the arm or leg. I have to stay overnight, and so I won't be at service. And I, of course, he's bless his heart. Now, he sent me another one. Uh, after I responded earlier this evening, he said, Thanks, Pastor. The latest word is no ablation. A cardiac electrophysiologist wants to try medication and possibly a pacemaker. I'll know more tomorrow. I'll be missing tonight's service. Okay. It's okay. You can miss tonight's service. So why don't we uh, pray for Mark and just really petition the throne on his behalf. So why don't you join with me? Loving Heavenly Father, we're <laughs> ever so grateful to you once again that when we have a situation like this, we can come to you in prayer as the great physician and by faith, even though our faith is maybe only the size of a mustard seed, we can pray and ask you for your healing touch for our brother. Lord, would you specifically give the physicians wisdom from above supernaturally so that they might be able to correctly diagnose and treat Mark's heart condition. Would you even now tonight as he sits in the hospital room would you just comfort him and encourage him and Laura with him and Lord, return him to us. And Lord, just remove whatever it is. And somehow just heal his heart, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So on Thursday nights, we're going through 1 Kings, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Tonight, we are going to actually do two chapters. I know. I know, we'll be here till 10. No, we won't be here till 10. Uh, there are actually <laughs> two short chapters, and I will try to be as brief as I possibly can without cannibalizing what's here before us tonight. Um, and um, while you're turning there, I'll kind of set the stage with the backstory. Last week, God had established Solomon's throne, succeeding his father David and had given him supernatural wealth and wisdom because when God approached him and said to him, what would you have me to give you? His answer was, not wealth, not kill all my enemies, which, let's be honest, we would have maybe entertained that as <laughs> something we would know. I mean, come on, aren't there names coming to mind right now that... But he didn't ask for that. He asked for wisdom. <laughs> and because he asked for wisdom, God also added unto him all of this wealth, uh, just like none before him and like there would be none after him as well. So now what we're going to see tonight is Solomon uh, is going to appoint his cabinet, his administration. And I, I know that sounds boring, uh, but it is really interesting, as we're about to see. Uh, it's actually another demonstration of Solomon's supernatural wisdom, as we're about to see, because of the way he goes about it. It is really fascinating. So why don't we pray? We'll ask God's blessing on our time together in his word. Lord, would you settle our minds and focus our attention by the Holy Spirit that we might just give you our undivided attention tonight in our time together in your word. Would you keep all of the distractions 
and anything that would hinder us away from us tonight, even the humidity, Lord, if you could somehow just keep everything away so that we can focus completely upon you and your word. Lord, thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 1. So King Solomon was king over all Israel. And verse 2, these were his officials. Azariah, the son of Zadok, the priest. Elihoref and Ahijah, the sons of Shisha. Scribes, Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, the recorder. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, over the army. Zadok and Abiathar, the priests. Verse 5, Azariah, the son of Nathan, over the officers. Zabud, the son of Nathan, a priest and the king's friend. Abiashar, uh, pardon me, Ahishar, verse 6, over the household. And Adoniram, the son of Abda, over the labor force. And verse 7, and uh, pay attention to this verse. We're going to uh, come back to it here in a moment. And Solomon had 12 governors over all Israel who provided food for the king and his household. And interesting, each one made provision for one month of the year. Again, I want to come back to that. Now, this is interesting in the sense that what he does here, if you really think about it, is extremely complicated and I believe next to impossible absent this supernatural wisdom that God had given him. And what I mean by that is uh, this is nothing shy of brilliant. I mean, this is just brilliant. He's able to organize everything. I mean, he's got a huge household to feed, as we're going to see here shortly. But everything is organized and in order, and it's going to run smoothly and seamlessly. And again, verse 7, to me, is a good example of this where we're told, I mean, how brilliant is this? Think about this. He assigned 12 governors to provide his food, a governor for each month of the year. How would you like to have that deadline? Where <laughs> you only, so let's just say for purpose of illustration that your month is September. So you provide all of the food for all of the household, for the king, for the month of September, and then October 1, the pressure's off. And you have basically 11 more months until your next deadline. I would love that. I would love that. <laughs> One has noted that what Solomon does here is outside the proverbial box. And by that, I mean that these 12 governors, one for each month of the year, were not specifically from the 12 tribes of Israel. And usually whenever you see 12, something organized or delineated by 12, it's usually in the context of the 12 tribes of Israel, the firstborn from each tribe. But that's not the case here. And here's the point. Oftentimes, wisdom would have us to do something other than the way it's always been done before. I, I remember on the mainland that uh, in my employment <laughs> that there would always be the older, seasoned, you know, employee who had tenor, who had been there for years, and they would always say something to this effect, it's just the way we've always done it around here. Ooh, maybe that's the problem. <laughs> maybe that's the problem. You've been doing the same thing around here all the time. It's the same way. And Solomon sort of breaks from that and does something out of the ordinary. I think maybe the takeaway is sometimes maybe the way to do it is not the way it's always been done before. Something else I want to point out before we move on, and it has to do with Solomon's leadership, the wisdom of Solomon's leadership. So each of these 12 governors were responsible for only one month instead of having one governor 
overseeing all 12 months. I mean, typically in a, an organizational structure, you've got one guy at the helm, and he oversees 12 assistant managers, if you will, underneath him. And those assistant managers are in charge of their departments, all 12 of them. But the buck stops with the guy that's at the helm. And Solomon doesn't do that. And so I think to me this speaks of his leadership style being one that's not oppressive. And we're about to see something that we're told in the detail that's uh, here in our uh, text tonight that he had a big heart. Solomon had a big heart. This is a guy that you would want to work for. He just had a big heart and he, w he was not a hard guy to work for, wasn't oppressive and very wise. <laughs> and with that wisdom and with that wealth came a really soft heart. Verse 8, these are their names. Now this is the names of the 12 and I'll do my best on these. Ben-Hur in the mountains of Ephraim, Ben-Deker, verse 9, in Makaz, Sha'albim, Beit Shemesh, and Elan, Beit Hanan, verse 10, Ben-Hasid, in Arobath, to him belonged Sukkoh, and all the land of Hefer. Verse 11, Ben-Abinadab, in all the regions of Dor, he had Taphath, the daughter of Solomon, his wife, Ba'anna, the son of Ahlud, in Ta'anach, Megiddo, and all Beit Shean. These are names I think that sound familiar to those of you who went to Israel with us. Which is beside Zeratan, below Jezreel, from Beit Shean to Abel Moholah, as far as the other side of Jachniam. Ben Geber, verse 13, in Ramoth Gilead, to him belonged the towns of Jair, the son of Manasseh, in Gilead, to him also belonged the region of Aragab in Bashan, 60 large cities with walls and bronze gate bars. Verse 14, Ahinadab, the son of Ido in Mahanaim, Ahimaaz, verse 15, in Naphtali. He also took Basimoth. Basimoth was my mom's name, by the way. In Hebrew, it's Basimoth. In Arabic, it was Basima. You didn't pronounce the F at the end. That was my mom's name. That's my mom. How cool is that? My mom's name right there. Daughter of Solomon as wife. Verse 16, Ba'ana, the son of Hushai, in Asher and Alath. Verse 17, Jehoshaphat, the son of Parua, in Issachar. Shimei, verse 18, the son of Elah, in Benjamin. Geber, verse 19, the son of Uri, in the land of Gilead, in the country of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and of Og, king of Bashan. He was also, uh, he was the only governor who was in the land. Now here again we're introduced to these 12 governors, and what's interesting is that anytime you see 12 in Scripture, it's always associated with perfect government, God's perfect order, God's perfect government. You have the 12 disciples, you have the 12 tribes, it's also interesting to note that of all of the times that you see 12 in the scriptures, it totals 187 times. And of those 187 times you see the number 12 in scripture, it's mentioned 22 times in just the book of Revelation alone. The description of the New Jerusalem, 12 all over the place, the 12 pillars, the 12 names and of the 12 tribes, the 12 disciples. Again, it's a number, uh, the number of government. Verse 20, Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and rejoicing. So, verse 21, Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. By the way, just a little uh, side note, during Solomon's reign, Israel occupied more of the promised land than at any other time in Israel's history, in the history of Israel, to the present day, by the way. Uh, if my math is right, and if my memory is correct, uh, they, 
at that time under Solomon's reign possessed something like, uh, I'm going to botch it. Anyway, it was three times the amount of the land that Israel has today. Something like 10,000 square miles. It is just a small country. And during Solomon's reign, it was significantly more than that. And here we're given the borders, and I, I don't know if you noticed this, but as far as the border of Egypt. Uh, let me also say, just parenthetically, that uh, I was hearing today that uh, tomorrow, the 14-year anniversary of 9-11, by the way, you know what they're going to do tomorrow? I, I think they're going to do it. Uh, they're going to vote on the Iran nuclear deal on September the 11th, 14 years after that fateful day. And this after there has been so many that have tried everything that they can to stop this deal, which to me is an exercise in futility. I'm sorry to say, it just seems like that it is a foregone conclusion and are we surprised? Are we surprised? Uh, let me just, since I'm already way off script here, let me just also add, um, for those of you who were watching on um, Monday, uh, excuse me, Tuesday, because Monday was Labor Day, uh, when Kim Davis was uh, suddenly, inexplicably actually, by the same judge, this Judge Bunning released uh, from prison. And um, I was watching this uh, on Fox News, and I don't know um, if you watch this, but it so happened to be during uh, the time that Shepard Smith was on uh, Fox News. I don't know if you're familiar with Shepard Smith, but um, he is no friend of Christians. And some, I was in disbelief uh, during this uh, broadcast where he broke into the broadcast and said of Kim Davis and all of her supporters, these are the very people that don't want Sharia law. That was my, that was my response. Did, did he just really say that? And I don't do this. Uh, I, I had to stop quite some time ago, but I used to watch CNN on mute, you know, just on mute. But I couldn't do that anymore because <laughs> of the ticker tape <laughs> down below, and I just, you know, I just couldn't hack it anymore. And uh, so I switched over to Fox Business on one TV. I have Kahlo, you know, uh, TV, Channel 25, a local Christian TV station. Then I have Fox Business, and I have Fox. And so I, um, when Shepard Smith did that, I just, I, I couldn't, I won't tell you what I did, but I, I just, I, it was unbelievable to me. Uh, and he said, he has said in the past very snarky comments uh, concerning Christians. And particularly when it comes to same-sex marriage, uh, of which he is a big fan of. And no fan and no friend of Christians. Anyway, so... <laughs> I, I turned to CNN, and as God is my witness, their coverage of the Kim Davis release, and she, you know, talked, and Mike Huckabee was there, and her attorney was there, and CNN actually was more fair to this woman and what was taking place than was Fox News. And it, I thought it was just me. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm just getting really cranky in my old age and in these last days. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just too sensitive, you know, and hypersensitive even to these things. And then uh, it wasn't long after that that all of a sudden all of social media lit up about Shepard Smith and what he did. And I thought, oh, God, I'm not losing my mind. It's not just me. <laughs> there are other people like me that saw the same thing that I did. The only reason I bring that up is because when it comes to things like what we're seeing now with this whole same-sex marriage and Christians who stand up for the Word of God being thrown into jail without bail, and this is not the will of the people. There are some over 70% of the 
um, Americans in the United States of America that oppose same-sex marriage, which is why they did what they did the way they did it. And Mike Huckabee explained it better than I've ever heard anybody explain it about the three legislative branches of U.S. government. The Supreme Court is one of the three and cannot make laws. They can only interpret laws. They cannot make laws. Only Congress can make laws. And it's very interesting to me that tomorrow we're going to see this Iran nuclear deal, which, by the way, uh, this morning I saw this number, something like 21% of Americans support. 21%. Now, you tell me. You tell me. And I, Sunday first service, I got, I like to call it righteous anger, but, I, you know, I, I had somebody email me, and I had to apologize to him because... You know, they just it startled them. They're elderly, and I really felt bad, you know. But my, <laughs> um, my passion, let's call it my passion, concerning this, I just, I want to keep it under the control of the Holy Spirit. But you tell me, how is it possible that a deal with the devil, and that's what it is, can go through and pass when you have 22% of the American people that support it. You tell me. How is that even possible? In the last days they will call evil good and good evil and Isaiah says a curse to them that do that and they're doing it anyway. Um, one last thing. Okay, this is the last thing. If, and it looks like it's a pretty much a done deal, if this happens tomorrow, um, I think we're done. It's the final straw and it's the final nail in the coffin. And we have all but th turned our backs against Israel. In the UN this month they're going to fly the UN uh, the uh, Palestinian flag, the Palestinian flag in the UN. Um, this does not bode well for America. Uh, Genesis 12, 2 and 3 uh, come to mind that any nation who blesses Israel, God will bless. And any nation that curses Israel, God will curse. It does seem to me uh, that we are still living in the residual blessing of having blessed Israel in times past. And we're about to turn a corner, I believe, that uh, we will finally uh, turn our backs against Israel and then it's just a matter of time well that's depressing I know let's move on <laughs> it's important to understand that Israel during this time had enjoyed this season of peace and prosperity because of the battles that David had won prior this is the only reason that they're enjoying this time of grand and glorious peace and prosperity and I point that out because in a, in a sense it's a type in that it speaks of Jesus our greater than David who won the battle of battles over sin and death so we could enjoy peace namely the peace of God that comes vis-a-vis -vis peace with God whenever one comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The point being is the battle has already been won and now we can enjoy that peace with God, the peace of God. Verse 22, now Solomon's provisions, try to get your mind around all this, for one day, now this is just daily, <laughs> how would you like to have this Costco list, right? 30 cores of fine flour, 60 cores of meal, Verse 23, 10 fatted oxen, 20 oxen from the pastures, and 100 sheep. That's a lot of lamb. Besides deer, gazelles, roebucks, and fatted fowl. For he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river, from Tipsah even to Gaza, namely over all the kings on the side of the river, and he had peace 
on every side all around him. Okay, check this out. One has calculated how much food this much could feed, and they estimate that it would be about 35,000 people. One day, one day, 30, talk about just the logistics. And this is why I think it's brilliant when you think about the organization of appointing one governor per month. So you, would, you want February. I want February, <laughs> you know, even on leap years, I've only got 29 and the guy that's got July has got 31. That's two more days of feeding 35,000 people. And just to put it into perspective, that's about the population of Kaneohe, roughly, isn't it? How would you like to feed all of Kaneohe every day <laughs> that many people with this much food? Very complex. I mean, just the sheer volume of food that would be prepared for Solomon's household, which means that he had, this is what I call overhead. <laughs> this is what I call overhead. Again, it's a, another example of the supernatural wealth that God had given to Solomon. He had prospered him greatly and provided for him magnificently. Verse 25, And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan as far as Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. Solomon, verse 26, had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Again, for those of us who went to Israel, these are those famous Solomon's stables. <laughs> you got to put those horses somewhere. <laughs> and that's where he had to put them all. 40,000 stalls. 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. And, and 12,000 horsemen. 12,000. That's his mind numbing, man. And verse 27 these governors, each man in his month, provided food for King Solomon and for all who came to King Solomon's table. Speaking of the guests, there was no lack in their supply. They also, verse 28, brought barley and straw to the proper place for the horses and steeds, each man according to his charge. Wait, did you catch that? So not only are you feeding all of these people, you got to feed the animals too. Are you kidding me? <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, this expression, each man under his vine and his fig tree, was a, a proverb of sorts, and it described a time of peace and prosperity. And again, David had achieved this as a mighty warrior prior. But... We got a problem here. We see now a problem beginning to develop because didn't God say not to multiply horses? He forbid the multiplying of horses. And now, and we, and we saw it a little bit last week where Solomon began to multiply wives. And he took an, as wife the daughter of Pharaoh, and that wasn't his first wife. And he did it sort of strategically, politically, to make peace with Pharaoh, and he did. And it wasn't so much a problem of that, more so it was a problem that he was beginning now to multiply wives. And here we see him now begin to multiply horses. And the reason it was forbidden was this. If you multiply horses, then the tendency on the part of the people is to then begin trusting in those horses, in the numbers, the multitudes of the horses. There's a proverb that says that some trust in horses and chariots, but I will trust in the Lord my God. You think about this, 40,000 horses, 12,000 horsemen. Uh, you would start trusting just in the sheer numbers of horses that you had and chariots that you possessed. Verse 29, And God gave Solomon wisdom 
and exceedingly great understanding. And here it is, a largeness of heart, like the sand on the seashore. Now, this is interesting because typically when somebody is very wealthy, uh, they're also very snotty. That's for lack of a better word. <laughs> they, uh, in fact, there's a proverb that talks about the one who is wealthy gives a harsh answer. You know, wealthy people just tend to be really kind of mean people. And so, but that's not Solomon. He was actually a really kind man a largeness of heart. Look at this word picture, like the sand on the seashore. That's remarkable. Verse 30, thus Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. <laughs> For verse 31, he was wiser than all men, than Ethan, the Ezrahite, and Haman, Chalcol, and Dardat the sons of Mahal and his faint. I don't know who these people are, but apparently they were wise. But Solomon was wiser, and apparently the Holy Spirit wants us to know the names of these wise men from the East. Interesting. And his fame was in all the surrounding nations. Verse 32, he spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Uh, speaking namely of the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs, which is a great book, by the way. I don't know if we're going to get to that book before the rapture, but if we do, it's going to be rated PG-13. I'm just telling you now ahead of time, forewarning. <laughs> uh, verse uh, 33. Also he spoke of trees from the cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop. That's quite a contrast the majestic cedar trees of Lebanon, my birthplace, <laughs> to the hyssop was seen as just a lowly you know, plant to this big majestic tree. The, the implication being he understood everything in between. He had quite a uh, knowledge of these things. The hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. And men of all nations, from all the kings of the earth, who had heard of his wisdom, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now, here's the thing. Uh, this should come as no surprise, that Solomon's fame would spread throughout the entire earth, the known world at the time, because of his wisdom. Uh, it seems that word had spread. <laughs> There's this king in Israel, Solomon, who has wisdom that is unprecedented, the wisdom from God, and they would travel great distances to come and to hear it. And this is exactly what God had promised to Israel if they would obey the voice of the Lord and observe His commandments. In, in fact, Deuteronomy 28, really Deuteronomy 28 and 29, Deuteronomy 28 is a list of all the blessings that will come to those who obey the commands of God. And then chapter 29 are all the curses, the list of all the curses that would come upon those who disobey the commands of the Lord. And I tell you, <laughs> um, well, you might want to read them. Chapter 28 and chapter 29. And let me just take it a step further. This doesn't just apply to a nation. Although I would suggest that when you get to Deuteronomy 29, what you find there is a pretty apt description of that which has befallen us here in the United States of America for turning our backs on God. And chapter 28 is the polar opposite. It's really the antithesis. But verse 1 of Deuteronomy 28 says, Now, it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all His commandments which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. And then verse 10, Deuteronomy 28 says, Then all the peoples of the earth shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of you. 
I believe that the display of wisdom that we saw last week in chapter uh, 3, when the two moms came to Solomon, both claiming that the child that was alive was theirs and the child that was dead was the others, and Solomon's brilliant supernatural wisdom in identifying the real mom by saying, bring me the sword, cut that baby in two, give one half to the one and the other half to the other. And it's so interesting because the mom whose baby had died said, yeah, go ahead and cut the baby up. The real mom pleaded with Solomon, no, give the baby to this woman. And Solomon said, that's the mom, that's the mom. And I believe that that wisdom of what he did had spread throughout the entire land and people came from all over because of it. Chapter 5, verse 1. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon because he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father. For Hiram, this is key, had always loved David. Wow. So here you have the king of Tyre, which again is modern-day Lebanon, my birthplace, had heard now that Solomon had been anointed king. And because of his love for David, he sends his servants to Solomon, knowing as David's son that he was the one. Now this is the king of Tyre. <laughs> Not an Israelite, but he knows that Solomon is the one that is going to build the temple. And what we're going to see is, is that he's going to give Solomon the cedars of Lebanon. And you have to understand that cedar is a very strong wood to build with. It's also insect proof. And the cedars of Lebanon made famous in Lebanon were just these majestic trees. Uh, noting that Hiram is an abbreviation of Ahiram, one wrote that archaeologists have discovered a royal sarcophagus in Byblos of Tyre dated about 1200 BC inscribed with the king's name Ahiram. Apparently it belonged to the man in this passage. You know archaeology uh, authenticates and validates the infallibility of scripture. You know whenever they find an archaeological discovery, you know where they go to figure out what they found? They go to the Bible. They don't go to the Book of Mormon. <laughs> they don't go to the Quran. They go to the Bible. Whenever there's an archaeological dig. Verse 2, Then Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, You know, this is interesting, how my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the wars which were fought against him on every side until the Lord put his foes under the soles of his feet. Wow. You know what this tells me? Hiram and David had a very good relationship. And David had communicated to Hiram how that God would not allow him to build the temple. It would be his son. And he even knew why. Which is why Solomon would say, you know Hiram, because you were so close to my father, not only that it is he couldn't build it, but why it is. But now it's me on the throne. And as David's son, I'm the one who is now going to build a house for the Lord. I want to come back to that here in a moment. But this is, isn't this just like David? David to me is the, it was the quintessential diplomat. I mean, he had the wisdom to make a friend and an ally in this Hiram. And this Hiram would understand the spiritual side of this temple. And he's not an Israelite. And now he's going to be used of God in the building of the temple now that Solomon has been anointed king. Verse 4, but now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. And behold, verse 5, I propose to build a house for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spoke 
to my father David, saying, Your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, he shall build the house for my name. Now therefore, verse 6, command that they cut down cedars for me from Lebanon, and my servants will be with your servants, and I will pay you wages for your servants according to whatever you say, you name your price. For you know there is none among us who has skill to cut timber like the Sidonians. Now if you go into, I know some of you are really into history. I wish I had your, <laughs> you know, ability when it comes to history. This is a, an area of tremendous weakness, admittedly, uh, on my part. But uh, it's very interesting that the, um, the Sidonians in Lebanon, modern day, at that time, were very skilled in this area. And the Israelites were not. And here Solomon says, I will pay. You just name your price. You have the skill. You have the cedars. I'll send my men and you name your price. We want those cedars to build the temple. Now, I mentioned I wanted to come back to this, but it's this detail that can be easily missed at first. And it has to do with the temple being built in the name of the Lord. Now, stay with me on this because the significance of this is that the pagan temples were built for their gods, not in the name of their gods or for the name of their gods. One commentator of this wrote, it is to be an house for the name of the Lord. That is not the same as for the Lord, Pagan temples might be intended by their builders for the actual residence of the God, but Solomon knew that the heaven of heavens could not contain him, much less this house which he was about to build. No temple, no dwelling, no structure, no building could contain the true and the living God. It was built for the name of the Lord their God. Verse 7, so it was when he had heard the words of Solomon that he rejoiced greatly and said, blessed, wait a minute, this is, a, this is not an Israelite, blessed be the Lord this day. I think David had quite an influence on him. I wonder if he was a believer in the God of Israel. I believe he was. For he has given David a wise son over this great people. Then he had him, verse 8, sent to Solomon saying, I have considered the message which you sent me and I will do all you desire concerning the cedar and cypress logs. My servants, verse 9, shall bring them down from Lebanon to the sea. I will float them in rafts. How brilliant is this? By sea to the place you indicate to me and will have them broken apart. Then you can take them away and you shall fulfill my desire <laughs> by giving food for my household. Oh, hear them. No problem. We got lots of food. <laughs> we got lots of food. Then verse 10, Hiram gave Solomon cedar and cypress logs according to all his desire. And Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 cores of wheat as food for his household and 20 cores of pressed oil. Thus Solomon gave to Hiram year by year on a yearly basis. Uh, that's a good deal. That's a good trade. Verse 12, so... The Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he had promised him and there was peace between Hiram and Solomon and the two of them made a treaty together. Then verse 13, the king, then King Solomon raised up a labor force out of all Israel and the labor force was 30,000 men and he sent them to Lebanon, verse 14, 10,000 a month in shifts. There's that organization again. They were one month in Lebanon and two months at home. That's benevolent. Only one month away and two months at home. That's benevolent. Adoniram was in charge of the labor force. Verse 15, Solomon had 70,000 who carried burdens and 80,000 who quarried stone in the mountains. Hang on to that for a second besides 3,300 from chief, the chiefs of Solomon's deputies who supervised the people who labored in the work. 
and verse 17, the king commanded them to quarry large stones, costly stones, and hewn stones to lay the foundation of the temple. So verse 18, Solomon's builders, Hiram's builders, and the Gebelites quarried them, and they prepared timber and stones to build the temple. I want to bring the study to a close by showing you this picture again. I don't do this to make those of you who didn't go to Israel feel bad, uh, but those of us who did, uh, you might remember when we went underneath the Temple Mount and we saw these very stones that Solomon used that we're told about here in 1 Kings chapter 5. Now, you might remember that one stone, it was about just a little bit shy of 40 feet in length. And so remember the tour guide had one of us stand at one side of it and then the other <laughs> go down to the other. This is a large one piece stone. And do you know how much that stone weighed? Check this out. Between 500 and 600 tons. Tons. Now, when you're, this is the foundation of the temple, which over the years, all of the civilizations that were built on top of it, it's well below the ground level. And you walk through that, that tunnel. Carlton and I had a great time, didn't we? <laughs> Walking through that whole tunnel. It, it's quite a, it's quite, if you're claustrophobic, you didn't do it, and that's okay. <laughs> um, but, I mean, there were some passages, but you were walking, literally, what would have been street level of the temple that Solomon built. And these were the actual stones. And we were there, man. We were standing there, and we were touching those stones. 600 tons. Isn't that like 2,000 pounds per ton? Does somebody want to do that, that, that calculation? What is 2,000 pounds at times? That's, that's making my hair hurt. What little hair I have left hurt. Um, <clears throat> one thing we're going to see, and we'll bring it to an end, but it's really exciting. Um, you know, David had stored up all of the supplies for the temple. He couldn't build it, but that didn't stop him from preparing all that was needed for his son. And I'll even add, and I'll, I'll leave you with this, he even went before his son in making this relationship with Hiram in anticipation of the need for the cedars of Lebanon, something that he didn't already have in place for Solomon to build the temple. You have to understand that David had great wealth as well, not the, the likes of which Solomon would enjoy, but he had already had everything ready to go for his son. Oh, he so wanted to build that temple, but he could not. But that didn't stop him. And I think the, the lesson from that is when God says no, and there are times when God says no, it's not you and it's not now. You're, you're not the one. You're not the vessel that I'm going to choose to use. And we're prone to, when God says no, just kind of, okay, you know, sulk. <laughs> but David didn't do that. Okay, he accepted it. But that didn't stop him from making all of the arrangements. God didn't say, I couldn't prepare everything. He said, I couldn't build it, but he didn't say, I couldn't prepare all the materials to build it and prepare a relationship with Hiram so my son could build it. So when Solomon comes on the scene and takes the throne, all he has to do is sort of call in these markers that David had already arranged for him. It, it is so fascinating. Why don't you stand? We'll pray. Father, thank you so much. There's so much here that at first read you almost miss it. But Lord, <laughs> you're so good. 
You're just so good. You provide exceedingly, abundantly, above and beyond anything that we could ever think or ask. Lord, you're so gracious and so generous. And Lord, thank you for this time in Israel's history, this grand and glorious time of peace and prosperity. And Lord, we know that this time is coming again, yet future. Lord, we do pray for Israel today, and we do pray for your people and for the peace of Jerusalem in light of this deal with Iran. Lord, protect your people, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.